Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. My name is Kelsey Bixler, and I'm the Director of Growth Marketing at TouchPlan. And today our webinar is going to focus on the topic of collaborative pre-construction, how digitizing design and phase planning enhances project success. While well, I give everybody a minute to hop on here, I do want to let you all know that you're going to hear touch plan referred to during this discussion. But if you're interested in actually seeing the platform for yourself, we've got a couple options. So we've got a demo on demand, which is a video walkthrough of touch plan. We also have a live demo. Our next one is going to be December 16th at 12 p.m. Eastern. We also have a free trial if you're interested in actually getting your hands on the platform. And then finally, we have an ROI calculator that allows you to see the return on investment that you'll see on your projects by using TouchPlan. So I've dropped links to those in the chat on the right-hand side of your screen. So be sure to check those out after the webinar. On today's agenda, we've got brief introductions. We'll then get into our panel discussion. And then finally, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to drop those in the questions box on the right-hand side of your screen and we'll be sure to get to those at the end. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our host today, Carly Grippen. Carly, I'll let you take it from here. Hello, welcome everybody. My name is Carly Griffin, as Kelsey said. I'm a Senior Customer Success Manager here at TouchPlan, and I'm going to be your host. And so today we have uh, Adam Nelson and Tom Nye joining us uh, on our panel today. So they're going to be sharing their screens in just a second and we will get started. So uh, before we get started, I want to give each of you a moment to do a quick introduction, sort of let everyone know who you are um, before we get going. Adam, why don't you start? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Adam Nelson, Director of Planning and Scheduling at CRB. Afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Noy. I'm a, a Principal Consultant for Jacobs. Uh, working in the performance and operational excellence space on construction and infrastructure projects in the UK. Awesome, awesome. So our topic today, like Kelsey mentioned, we're talking about digitizing design and phase planning and how that helps enhance your project success. So we have a bunch of questions that we're going to go through in our panel. And then, like Kelsey mentioned, we're going to turn it over to audience questions. So to get started, let's just talk about that process of digitizing planning and how and how that helps. So my first question actually has to do with constraints because it's a huge topic when it comes to planning and design. And so how have you been able to identify constraints in the design phase and how has it helped you keep track of that schedule as you get going and as you continue planning? Sure, I can I can get us kicked off here. Uh, I, I think identification of constraints is, is one of the I'll call the unsung heroes of planning. It's uh, often overlooked and, and maybe doesn't get the respect that it really deserves. It, without constraints, uh, you can kind of consider yourself somewhat flying blind to some of that key information to get you to success. Um, so, so how have we been able to identify those? I think it's, it's really all about asking those right questions. So uh, what is going to prevent work from moving forward um, is one of the biggest ones, or what's going to prevent you from succeeding and i'm looking at the people that are doing the actual planning those are those are one of the first things that that i ask when i'm looking to identify constraints yeah i'll just build on that one carly and just say that yeah it's all about the questions one thing i've noticed obviously in, in the projects that i've been involved with is that uh design is, is sort of notorious for changes um and that those changes obviously will come as a natural part as it as it progresses and becomes more detailed and Sometimes that means scope creep, sometimes that means other things. But I mean, for us, one of the things that we've done in the UK is, is in addition to sort of asking those questions, we we run a sequence with the teams where it's using a tool like TouchPan, clear visual for everybody to see. But we do the left to right planning so that everybody is clear of what everybody is doing. So each discipline, whether that is the designer, whether that is procurement, whoever might be involved in that project. Uh, once it's got sort of first pass left to right, we then do right to left. So looking back uh, on the deadlines that we're trying to achieve for that project and the sort of key milestones that come with it, and that helps try and focus some of the disciplines and uh, to, to draw out what those constraints might be to them. Because I've often found that that 
people don't necessarily think what is going to block them from doing the work naturally so you kind of got to set the scene paint the picture and then try and draw on those lessons that they've had in the past to, to make sure they're either not repeated or they are repeated if they are, are a good lesson that's awesome and i think that leads me really nicely into my next question which has to go with those schedule variations things come up they're constantly going to be changes that's the nature of design that's the nature of what happened you're sort of you're building it as you go and planning it out um, so things are going to change so how when you're using touch plan or another digital solution you have uh, for different elements of planning how do you have you found ways to help minimize that schedule variation you mentioned the constraints but are there are other things you're using like variance reasons um, ppc other things you are tracking to help minimize that Ways go first, Adam. We'll rotate it for you. Go for it. I took the last one. We'll do every other. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, we we sort of couple it with a number of things. So it's not just not just around what those sort of tools offer, but it's also around working practices. So one thing we've we've tried uh, sort of planning long term through using a master schedule in something like P6 and breaking it down into a collaborative tool into some sort of digital software, which makes it more accessible for everybody to use. But what well, we're currently doing on a project that I'm on at the moment and actually seems to work quite well with design is the the last planner approach so the phase planning piece that you touched upon we tried to break it into 12 week or three month look ahead so that they'll take that master plan break it out into more detail we then map that down into that software into a bit more manageable chunk so it might be a long bar activity that's over 60 days and they're saying what they're then going to say what that means to them on a weekly basis so they're going to might make sure that they are committing to the right things uh, and progressing that as they should be we then track that as well in a weekly meeting production meetings to try and make sure that they are actually on top of it because in the uk sometimes design teams have not necessarily had that touch point to, to raise those constraints but then where the digital software piece comes in is it helps capture the reasons why uh things aren't done so like you said the variance reasons and that's where we can really home in or pinpoint to the project managers what they should be looking at whether they haven't got the right amount of resource whether a specific team is stopping them or or late in replying or giving them responses whether they supplied their supply chain issues you know all those sort of reasons that, that can help um, minimize schedule variation but it's probably also just worth pointing out there that uh, we've tried to standardize those so where we've used the digital tool what we found what I found initially is teams would create their own reasons and their own mm -hmm. reasons might be very similar across projects or teams but they're not standardized so you can't then take it that next level and say there's a common theme of resource or there's a common theme of supply chain so it's all it's, there still needs to be that element of control from a facilitation perspective to make sure that you can control that schedule variation yeah tom tom nailed it there there's not a, a lot for me to add except that uh really making ppc and variance reason part of your planning discussions it's a huge part of the learning phase um if we're executing the last planner system formally that that's built in right you're, you're doing that if you're doing the last planner system but even if we're stepping away from doing full-blown lps we could easily still be doing collaborative planning that still takes advantage of that data being gathered if we look at a tool like touch plan it's being gathered automatically and so if as long as you're running with the software using the software to even just part of its potential you're gathering this data and you're you're not helping yourself if you're not using it, it it's right there at your fingertips so make it part of your weekly planning make it part of your look ahead planning uh, and, and involve that data as part of your planning process well i think that's great because data is so being able to use the data is the important thing. And I think that that uh, element of sort of taking that to the next step. Uh, Tom, you mentioned the standardization of the variance reasons to be able to clearly look at the data. And Adam, you're talking about how taking that to the next level, incorporating into your process is huge. Do either of you have some examples of how you're using that data to sort of better look at the health of your planning? Maybe it's in dashboards or it's how you're working into conversations. How, how does that look in practice for you guys? Sure. So I'll, I'll springboard a little bit off of what I just mentioned is, is using the data that we're gathering in the planning practice or in our actual planning process. So um, I don't necessarily want to, excuse me, I don't necessarily want to just take this data and then hand it out in a, in a, in a report, right? It, it would be 
massively beneficial to make this part of your actual planning process. So what it looks like for us is, is we have uh, a weekly work planning meeting or a make ready planning meeting if you're doing the full blown last planner system. If you're still doing collaborative planning, hopefully once a week you're holding a look ahead planning meeting. And it's a really good data point to visit during that meeting is the PPC and variance reasons right there in Touch Plans dashboard, uh, right there available to you. Flash that information up, go over that information with the team because that, that instills a little bit more interest in the team members that are participating in the planning of the project. So once they actually get to see that data, you know, in the dashboard and view it live with you, then that, that, that really starts to help build that culture of continuous improvement that you're looking to get through your planning practices. Yes, and Tom, have you seen similar things? Yeah, exactly. I'd, I'd I completely agree with Adam, and I'd just say that we 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 probably it's not as been a smooth transition for some teams to to pick up using digital platforms to do this this sort of planning. Um, so we've tried to engender a bit of like team spirit and, and competition. So on the program one at the moment, there's 11 projects uh, within it. Some teams are naturally better and, and have picked the software up quicker than others. Um, and we've tried to encourage the teams to beat each other on PPC reasons. So, so if the, if the PPC is obviously better, there's sort of quarterly awards. It's only a little gift of like, you know, something small for the teams to just enjoy as, as a collective. But we're trying to get that participation on it because we should, some teams, like I say, have not necessarily picked up the software and taken it forward as their own. Um, and I think at the same time, that's a bit for the for the sort of senior management. It's a bit of an indicator for them to say which projects are perhaps going to need a bit of focus or, or perhaps struggling on their planning. Um, a because their PPC is lower, but B because they're they're consistently perhaps at the bottom of those sort of leagues. And I'm not saying you know it's a beating everybody up, but it's a it's a let's learn together and bring everybody up as as one uh, as we do. There's an interesting natural peer pressure that forms, and it's it, and it's a healthy one. It's not one that that is you know negative or, or a weapon, as you mentioned, Tom. It's uh, but just putting that data in front of them is what helps create and foster that behavior. I think some of the best teams I work with take take that same approach where it's not a used as like a tell me all the reasons you did something wrong. It's why are we all dealing with this and what can we do better? What have you seen work better on different projects? And everyone's got good ideas and everyone's experienced a lot of these challenges before. It doesn't matter if you're in the design process or you're already in construction. You're, there's these issues that are sort of common that are, are going to come up. And so someone might have an idea of where they saw it work better a, a different way. And that's how you're going to get those ideas out. Um, so I love that you guys are both putting that into your planning process because I think it, it brings out better planning for everyone. Constantly saying, if we're not looking at those variance reasons, we're just going to make the same planning mistake again. And we don't want that. So I think this actually leads into another question I have in here. And Tom, I think what you just mentioned is a really good example of this, but how has digitizing that planning process helped improve accountability for team members? Is that similar sort of what you're seeing of those senior managers seeing the project teams that are struggling a little? It's kind of highlighting that for them. So on the projects I'm involved with, uh, yeah, it sort of highlights to senior management and those that are, are interested in the data, which projects are struggling and, and need perhaps that bit of extra support to, to come along that not only that journey to digitize but also that journey just to have better planning um because it does naturally reflect up i think in terms of their, their master schedule uh whether they're good or bad uh, in in tools like touchpan but we also sort of use it so we've combined uh, or well, we have pulled those dashboards and created sort of a central visual, visual management system so they go into like a power app feature and we mm -hmm. display those in the office and that again encourages a a interest in it first of all and, and b that sort of collaboration around trying to get the team better and that feeds into something else so or the project i'm involved in is, is quite a big of a it's big on digital twin so everything they do must be in a digital environment uh there's a whole host of things that come with it in terms of bim etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's it's trying to pull it all together but at the same time i think we found it quite hard to communicate to the teams which is the main focus because it's a project which tried to be very innovative uh, and very mm -hmm. digital, deliberately digital is probably a way to put it. Um, but 
but at times some of the people that have been involved have perhaps been a bit lost so it's really highlighted to me the need to have a have a journey but also constantly bang that drum drip beat about what we're trying to achieve from each tool and how it all feeds together in that process like Adam said earlier uh, had to come together and ultimately support the project manager to deliver their projects for the senior leadership team. Well, I think accountability really starts at at coming to where your people are. Like mm -hmm. it's we're we're all on a very different journey when it comes to our our ability to plan, uh, whether natural or or learned. And so understanding where people are is where accountability kind of starts. And for us as facilitators or the SMEs of of our companies, or sometimes just those who are trying to get this started. Um, it's important to understand that you can't just be holding people accountable immediately if they don't understand exactly a how to use it, but b just how to do the basic behaviors and mindsets around it. And so um, that that's one piece of advice I'd probably give is just to take a, a a mental survey of where your team's at and where you're actually starting. And then once you jump into the process, going into a digital world for planning kind of changes approach in a lot of ways it it, it opens a lot of doors and it, it also presents a few challenges and so i'll i'll highlight that uh if you think about how technology is being used for your project and how well it's being received or not that consideration alone will help clarify which doors are wide open for you and which ones are going to be challenging to unlock uh for for us we, we've got a lot of great experience on the design side and uh, in pre-construction specifically because those teams of, of designers and engineers are working on their computers quite commonly if not all day long so they're very used to looking at screens very used to doing virtual meetings or very used to, to planning in a virtual or digital space rather than maybe physical on a whiteboard or something like that and so um, that accountability comes quite naturally where the accountability may be on a on a construction site with a lot of folks that aren't necessarily used to using technology in their day-to-day -day or a telephone or a, or a computer in their day-to-day -day, you've got to kind of adjust for what you would expect out of those folks and the accountability piece is is going to come with experience and using the tool i'd also just uh, and just before you move on carly they uh actually went back yesterday and did a uh, an old school i call it old school but an in-person post-it note uh collaborative planning session so digital is probably a combination of things so for some of the teams they still need to go back and do it manually on the wall mapping it out so they can see it in one room together um, but digitalization definitely has its piece to, to sort of improve that accountability because you can you can track it um, but equally like adam says the challenges that we found coming from that are around variant or people can move things in a plan and unless the right uh escalation processes are in place i suppose the project manager or the planner might not know things have changed so it's it's quite difficult to manage and it, that is a challenge that's something that project managers we try to highlight to them in terms of how they they keep that accountability and, and sort of balance digitization versus sort of older or traditional approaches i guess not older no i think those are two excellent points but sort of meeting everyone where they are and making sure you're coming to this process with an open mind and everyone's being heard. I think that's huge because I think that's how you're going to get adoption of anything, a new planning process, a new software, whatever it is. You got to make sure everyone sort of bought in and understands the goal of why we're doing this. Um, and you're, and Tom, your point of having that process is important. If there's not a process around why we're adopting this digital planning process, um, it's going to be hard for the team to see what, why we're doing this. Um, and so I think that's important to think about as teams are, are considering bringing a digital solution into the design phase or into phase planning, sort of how, how that's going to change and what they need to consider doing from the process standpoint. I think those are really excellent points. All right, let's see. Other questions I have written down here. Okay, one of them I think is kind of a, a fun one and can be sort of interesting to see different people's perspective. Um, so it has to do with sort of, we at TouchBlend often like to say we're sort of the single source of truth because everyone is seeing the same information. We're all in the same planning space. Um, but Tom, you mentioned that can bring them bring them some challenges sometimes. So how has having this sort of everybody has access to the planning space, everyone's looking at how has that impacted how your teams work together, um, and what are some sort of challenges that you look look out for that? Uh, I think you said what are the challenges around working 
uh, I'll keep in a single source of truth for touch band. My internet broke up a little bit there, but did I miss yeah. anything else? <laughs> no, go for it. <laughs> yeah, so like I sort of touched upon previously, we we use a, a master schedule, which is done in, in P6 or Asta or whatever tool you're using, maybe even MSP in some projects. Um, and that's then broken down into the touch plan and or any sort of digital tool where you can do planning tool where you can use it. But we have found that it is not very, um, or it's very challenging to map when things have changed. So it does create duplication of work is, is one of the questions we get asked a lot in terms of why are we copying the plan into another tool? And that you have to emphasize the fact that it's deliberate to make sure that the plan is correct, that what they're doing is right and how it features with, or how it fits in with other disciplines to, to progress the project against the overall plan. Um, and you just have to have uh, a common, it's really important that the project manager is strong, I suppose, in, in understanding that wider plan to, to communicate it down to them and having those processes in place that if something does change, it's there. What we've also had to do to sort of encourage that single source of the chief is we've just actually brought in recently a, a sort of secondary meeting where all the project managers report into uh, a program director, what their, their touch plan uh, metrics, why it's dropping, what's going on, and that's to try and increase that accountability to make sure it does align with that master schedule, which then gets reported to the client. So it's we didn't want to bring that in because we wanted it to sort of become a natural flow where people were using it and it, nobody wants more meetings these days. But we're going to we're just just bringing that in to to sort of see how that goes and improves it going forward. So that's that's another measure we've sort of tried, um, but it's not easy. To be honest with you, it's not easy to get a single source of truth when you're using multiple platforms. For sure. Adam, have you seen something similar? Yeah, uh, I guess we could we could kind of step back and say that, that the digitizing of planning really allows you to do planning from anywhere in the world. And so what does that do for you? It opens the door to be collaboratively planning with anybody at any time, any day, from anywhere. Um, that's great, but what the challenges that come along with that are that you've got exactly that, but reciprocal of it. It's it's difficult sometimes to um, you know get that many people from that many places on a screen to collaborate exactly the way that you you hoped or you wanted. Um, so it does take a certain amount of um, I'll say command and control kind of as far as the actual process is concerned. It definitely, maybe the better way to say that would be set expectations. Um, and make sure that everybody understands exactly what is expected of them and, and what is what is expected that they don't do. Um, but at the same time, as we mentioned before, you've always got to be answering the question for processes and tools, what's in it for me? And it's not you as, as the individual, it's your teammates. What What is in it for them and what makes it valuable to them? And so using the collaborative planning methodologies, whatever you decide to use, make sure that it complements what's going on in your master schedule or in your other your other pieces of software that you might be using to complement one another um and, and that's that's the important piece is is just making sure that they understand as teammates that whatever they're doing is not a waste of time they, they can't ever have that sense of feeling and so using that as a as a tool to help them in their daily lives because in the end that's exactly what we're here to do right mm -hmm. I see some common themes here. Process is really important in explaining that goal so everyone sort of sees sees the vision. Um, so we just talked about some challenges that you run into with using a digital solution. How has using a planning software like TouchPlan helped you stay organized though and around these key decisions you have to make, whether it's design challenges you're facing or just key planning decisions? Well, springboarding off of what I just mentioned, it, it's all about getting more more people involved in the planning process, right? We're we're not here to be a command and, and control organization anymore. That that's and I'm sorry, not organization industry. Um, collaborative planning and, and planning projects together has been proven to be significantly more effective than building a plan and then pointing at somebody and saying you should do this. Um, so digitizing planning and something like, like touch plan is what opens that door to be able to involve a lot of people. That includes the important people like your clients that have an enormous impact on uh, your plan as a whole. So um, when it comes to capturing what they're responsible for, how that impacts the way that we're moving forward and, and things like that, there's a different level of understanding 
that we've been able to achieve by digitizing our tools, sending out those reports, or even including them in the collaborative planning process to help them understand how they impact things and how we can best move forward. Um, so that kind of harkens back to the questions we've asked before about accountability um, and capturing constraints. All of that stuff really comes down into that very, that very motion there of collaboratively involving everyone in the process and tackling challenges that way. Awesome. Tom, have you seen similar similar uh, process there? Yeah, I'd agree. It's just it's not just like like uh, Adam says, it's not just reporting up as a client. It's it's an ability to sort of bring the the supply chain on board earlier, um, have them in a in a common environment which everybody can access quite easily. is is really useful to to demonstrate to everybody the plan and to communicate that plan to people. I think what it's also sort of highlighted to to me is is there's also probably a, a new need on projects to have someone who's capable of analysing and interpreting the data that these sort of tools present, um, because you can have a project manager who might understand that they're achieving 60%, but they might not necessarily understand why or be able to interpret it and dive into the. I'm not. I'm obviously saying that's not always the case, but I think it's just encouraging people to have a slightly different mindset into how they use these tools um, to sort of stay organized, use them as leading indicators perhaps rather than sort of uh, uh, lagging indicators uh, so that you can actually see that become more predictive and predictable sorry and what you're doing and actually achieve the plan like you say so it's yeah it's, it's all very useful it's all very great um, as long as you've got the right people in the right place with the right mindset at the right time which is the challenge in, on any project. This leads me perfectly into my next question, which we're talking about how getting a ton of people involved, you're able to pull more information out of that. How have you seen that in terms of pulling in all these different functional teams into one platform impact that ability to see sort of the whole picture coming together? Tom, you were mentioning earlier that visual is really powerful, seeing it all to sort of come together. How have you seen that sort of manifest um, on your projects? On the projects I've been involved with, it's actually really varied. So some have gone for uh, quite a detailed approach. So every every discipline or every person involved will have a have like a swim lane, and they'll be able to map out what they're doing so they can see what's going on. That plan can very quickly become quite difficult to manage and quite hard to read and interpret and and scroll down to find what's relevant to to each individual. Others have gone for perhaps a bit more of a light touch, uh, and they've probably just put in or they have just put in sort of key milestones key activities around that to track for their that they need to track to meet their program um, and there is no right approach it, it depends on, on the project manager in, in that sense in terms of how they want to to deliver their projects but I think yeah there's a whole host of ways in which which is done but ultimately it's a, a challenge that needs to be or, or sorry I guess that the design of it needs to be around the one which suits the team that they've got to work with the people involved in the team probably what I'm trying to say there I think too, whether we're talking design, construction, it doesn't really matter. When you get into these very large projects that have very large plans, consider breaking up the meetings that you actually hold or breaking up the actual planning space into meaningful pieces that aren't going to, that are still going to be able to benefit from planning while maybe having separate meetings away from one another. And then of course have a, a, a meeting that comes together and make sure that everything is still working together quite nicely. But in design, you might consider uh, breaking things down by by team. If there's if there's teams working on different sectors or different pro parts of the project, you can easily separate out those those meetings or or break down those meetings into smaller groups of people for the detailed conversation. And then just bring together the leads that are associated the the the, the managers of that work for a collaboration meeting to make sure that all of those chunks are meeting, you know, are collaborating together the way that they should be or communicating together. The same thing goes for construction on maybe mega projects where you've got different areas broken out and the areas don't necessarily highly affect one another. Let's go ahead and break down those meetings into smaller, more meaningful pieces and, and break down those groups into more meaningful groups that then can communicate at a higher level when it comes to collaboration between the groups. I think that's a super interesting approach because I think you're right. Sometimes having the 
the benefits of being able to pull so much information from a lot of different people sometimes means you're on these massive meetings with a lot of different people and a lot of different opinions that you can lose focus. But by focusing in the conversation, you're able to get sort of more out of everybody. All right, let's see what next, what's the next question I have written down here. Okay, so question um, around using planning software. How does it help you and your teams identify design issues, not just for sort of planning, but in relation to cost, quality issues, um, constructability issues, things that you're able to, by planning this early in this detailed in the design process, hopefully mitigate to prevent from actually impacting you later on. Yeah, the thing that, that I found that I love about using planning software is that everything is happening live, right? It doesn't matter where we are, everything that we're doing together is all happening in the same space. So that allows us to actually build in delays or build in challenges with our teammates rather than having to go through a master schedule process that becomes more of a software receive, report out, back and forth game. You can really build in whatever challenge you come across, uh, whether it be a delay or a constraint or whatever, and then manage that impact or build a mitigation impact plan to that in the moment with, with your teammates. So that becomes a very collaborative approach to building out, uh, I'll call it risk management really is what it ends up being. And then that also helps you then quantify how many days, for example, something might be an impact for that you can then throw into your cost system and begin using that as a measurement for those situations um so that that's part of what what we've been able to do is is just make that a, a great big collaborative effort instead of you know a, a report out kind of a thing and, and then get information back i love that approach because i think uh that's how you're going to be able to see see that impact and hopefully prevent these things in the future Tom, do you have sort of similar similar situation or completely different perspective on it? No, so I'd, I'd agree with what Adam said. I actually probably got quite a recent example of that on, on one of the projects I work with where um, one of the designers is essentially waiting a piece of information from the ground investigation team. So they're due to give a report to the designers over here. Um, that report was due, say, a couple of weeks ago. It's now going to be in the middle of December, so it's pushed back and rather let that have an impact on on the cost, the time, and everything that comes with it, and, and the, the the delays that come from it, um, what they've actually been able to do is see quite visually through this these tools that that delay is a going to happen, and then they've also been able to then have an offline conversation to identify what pieces of that report they can sort of uh, speed up or expedite earlier, and and bring in to not cause that delay into the design. To continue going forward so they can actually get the relevant information earlier from from those who are generating the report so that's sort of like a i completely agree with what adam said and, and sort of a good good example of how it's it's been used to to prevent that impact i guess on cost and time no i think that's awesome it's always good to have um when you're able to catch those it feels good <laughs> being able to build that in Alrighty. so i want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions from the audience I know Kelsey has been gathering some. So if you have not written in your question yet, but you have thought of one, type them into the questions area. You should see that on the right hand side. There should be a questions drop down. Go ahead, type them in. For those who have already come in, Kelsey's going to go ahead and ask them. Hello again. Oh, and can y'all? Hello. Well, you see my background. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello again. Um, I do have a couple questions from the audience, so let me get those pulled up. So one, uh, collaboration has obviously been a huge theme throughout this discussion. Um, and Adam, I know we've talked a little bit about how TouchPlan isn't just construction planning software, it's really all about collaborative planning. So I'll start with you on this question. Um, what are some ways that you are fostering collaboration on your team? So it's a great big topic. Um, you've got to really build culture around around that question. So so it it starts by making sure that everybody understands exactly what we're trying to do here, and that you open the gate for trust and transparency, which is not often a common 
theme in our industry, but it certainly should be when it comes to this type of planning. So everything we've mentioned before is really hinged on respecting those around you and making sure that you're being fully open and honest and transparent. Um, and, and so that that's where all of that begins. Um, what was the actual word that was used, Kelsey? There was one I was focusing in on. Foster collaboration. So fostering collaboration through that. So you can't really foster that collaboration or build that culture without those those three key things, which is respecting those around you, uh, trusting, and then and then being honest. Um, once you have those things, then it becomes a, a lot of what we mentioned before, which is making sure you hold these meetings where the people that are responsible for the work are the ones doing the planning. Because in the end, that's where the collaboration needs to be. It, it, it's in the discipline leads or the, the, uh, the, the, sorry, the discipline leads for your design. It's possibly in your superintendents or your foreman for construction. Um, but those are the folks that have the knowledge. So let's get them involved in, in this planning process. And that's how we can foster a lot of collaboration between the two is getting them together um, and just talking through things. Asking those open-ended questions is probably the very best way. Once you get the folks together, you get the culture set up ask open-ended questions about things and let them do the talking. The goal should be as a facilitator for you to kind of step backwards. I think of the the gif of Homer Simpson stepping backwards into the bushes a lot. <laughs> but <laughs> that should be the goal for any facilitator. And once your team really starts talking on their own, that's where you know you can kind of sit back, listen, and just watch the fireworks. Love it, love it. Tom, what about you? What are you all doing to foster collaboration on your team? Uh, I completely agree. It's the same same sort of process as with Adam in, on that one, I guess. It's probably only two other things that try to do as a, as a sort of facilitator, or, or I try to do is one, once you get to know the people, it's sort of making sure that, or, or trying to keep the sessions as, as fun as they can be. I know that's a very difficult thing to do when it comes to planning, because it's not known as being fun. But if you can, <laughs> can sort of keep everybody engaged, keep them uh, enjoying those sessions and making sure that they can see the output is worthwhile. I think that really helps um, create buy-in and encourage collaboration. And then exactly like Adam says, you sort of step back and they have those conversations without you and you, you're much less of a facilitator and more of a, an actions and, and note taker. And, you know, and, and that's great. That's a, that's a good job done. And I think the second part as well, from my perspective is around, um, so when you're running these sessions, if you do get feedback, sort of responding to it and, if it's you know constructive feedback and, and not just people fed up of having too many meetings or something like that it's it's a case of actually acting on it and they can see that you're acting on it that helps their buy-in that helps them see people are listening and encourages them to stay involved with the process rather than sort of become uh, disillusioned and perhaps step back perfect perfect um so we've got another question and this actually ties in perfectly with adam what you were just talking about with company culture um, so how have you found using technology has impacted your company's culture? Oh, yeah. So it's <laughs> it's it's pretty cool to see. Um, another big topic uh, is <laughs> building culture, right? That's obviously an enormous an, an enormous topic by itself, but um, using planning to help build culture becomes a really nice foundational piece for all of those things that you want to be rooted within your culture. So first off, in just introducing it, people have to understand how to plan and how to how to use the software for digitizing this thing. So let's introduce the principles that we want to want to uh, cover, which might come with some training or some basic webinars just like this that go out to your your internal culture. Um, but it's just it, it's instilling those basic uh the, those basic principles of, of trust transparency honesty respect making sure that people understand that this isn't something that's going to be used against them this is something that benefits all of us and and this is something that we should be open to um and then from that point the the digital world of planning is just it's wide open it's it's so accessible it's so easy to get to so long as you're used to using a computer and so it naturally becomes part of your day-to-day -day quite quickly on a project. Um, even in projects where we've had a hard time with, with teams understanding the benefit, you can still step back 
uh, do things like like Tom was just saying. Make sure you hold plus deltas, which or, or whatever you may want to call it. Whatever they are, they allow you to gather what is going well and what are some things that we can do to improve. And those help you build your culture. Make sure that you don't just take those as a list. Do something about them, you know. Um, and that helps build that culture up as well. Um, another piece that that we've been visiting a lot is when you have a team that is having a hard time understanding what what's what the benefits are or you have a hard time building that right culture take a moment to step back and do a retroactive you know take a planning meeting and instead of doing planning maybe take that one and start asking the questions of what are we do what are we what have we been doing to this point that we want to continue doing and what are the things that we want to stop doing to this point and and it allows the team to really have an open voice and like tom mentioned earlier understand that they have an enormous impact on this, which helps build that culture as well. Awesome, awesome. Tom, what about you? How has technology impacted your company's culture? Yeah, so it's a really interesting question and I think I, I think it would differ depending on who you speak to. Uh, I think it's I think it's hugely positive in the fact that you know you can speak to people anywhere like we are now. I'm in the UK, you guys are in the US. Um, people are more, much more empowered to do the work that they they need to do because they've got the platforms in which to plan it and do it. Um, you can be flexible. You can have an, uh, flexible in a sense that what were traditional site-based roles, uh, they can now move and become not necessarily fully virtual, but they can become partly hybrid uh, at, at least. But then at the same time, I think it presents challenges and challenges around accountability, which we sort of touched upon and. and because people aren't necessarily present, people can't necessarily read people's emotions in the same way as you can when you're in a room, body language, so on and so forth. It's it's quite um can be impersonable and really hard to generate that culture. And I think that's where it's really key on like uh the facilitator to make sure that there is that technology is used, but also that it recognizes that um change kind of technology is great, but it also means change. Some people don't like change, react to change in different ways. So it's important that you manage that uh, going forward. And I think one thing that's really stood out to me on the project that I'm on is there's quite a big churn of people that are involved and you kind of get into a rhythm or a habit of, uh, you know, we're doing it this way, we've done it this way, people ask what's going on. And you sometimes people have joined and because they're perhaps in the meeting, video off, can't put face to the name, you kind of just assume they know how to use these tools straight away, what their idea is or what the intention behind them is. Um, so you can't forget about those people. You need to make sure that they're brought on the journey, whether that's through drop-in sessions once a week or, or making the time to, to bring them up to speed with why you're using it. Um, I think that's one of the big challenges. Uh, and you know, I think it will continue to be that way as everyone seems to be hybrid and, and working remotely going, going forward. So yeah, I think positively and negative and would really depend on who you speak to. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for that. Um, so my next question is interesting. Uh, what's the ideal PPC you're aiming for and why is that your target? Um, I think that's really interesting. I talked to some customers where to, having too high of PPCs shows that you're kind of bearing problems um, and it doesn't allow you to really identify issues uh, as easily. So uh, Adam, I'll start with you. Is there an ideal target that you're aiming for? Sure, yeah, we have to accept that our world is, is not perfect. And if it is perfect, we should be looked at as why, <laughs> you know, is it is it truly something that's going absolutely world breaking astounding or is this uh, are we sandbagging <laughs> is a polite way to put it. Um, but for actual literal values that we're going for, it really varies based on where you are in a project and it should. This is this is the natural evolution of a project means that the re reliability. Uh, and the knowledge that we have on our project changes as well. So if, if we start early in design, I'm pretty happy with 50% PPC. If this is in a conceptual design phase, we're going through a lot of exploration. Um, the client is making a lot of decisions. We're making a lot of changes in design to be, you know to reflect those. And and if we're at 50%, sure, that's a, that's a metric that I feel is healthy. If we're above that, great. We can evaluate if we're below that. Sure, still great. Let's see exactly what's going on there. Um, if we're in detailed design, I'm, I think I'm aiming more toward that 60 to 70% value, if, it, if it's my personal take. Again, we're still doing some exploration. We're still doing some discovery in detailed design. 
And so we're still not shooting for an enormous number, but we're, we're definitely looking to increase that reliability since our knowledge of the product is getting higher. And then if I'm in construction, this is where hopefully our design is complete or near complete. By this point, we know what the heck we're building. Um, I'm, I'm looking at around that 80% number. Um, I know some folks are really shooting for 90%, but um, I guess before we, we finish answering this question too, it's to understand, uh, to make sure that everybody understands that PPC is not necessarily a measure of project health. It's a measure of reliability. And, and that's what we're looking for. We don't look at uh, PPC. It, it's really, really easy for us to look at stats and numbers and jump straight into green, yellow, red, good, bad, neutral. Um, and sure, there's paired with variance reasons. There's plenty of reasons to categorize things that way when it comes to PPC. But the initial look at it has to be at a hmm, data, not a oh or yay kind of a situation. We should be looking at the data as an opportunity to learn, not an opportunity to, um, you know, measure. Perfect. No, I really like how you differentiated project health with PPC. I think that's great. Um, Tom, what about you? Is there an ideal PPC range that you're looking for? Or does it vary? What's your thoughts there? So much like Adam, I think it, it, it definitely does vary. And this is actually a, it's a common question we get asked because someone once phrased it to me as if I've got five activities for a week and I'm working a five day week, if I don't do one, so I'm achieving 80% PPC, in theory, I'm, each one is a day long. I've lost a day in that week. So you're not being productive for what you're doing. And when you think of it like that, you're, you can see the merit. So it's really important to consider, like what Adam says, not just looking at PPC in isolation, bringing in variance reasons, bringing in uh, all the other dashboards that are there. There might even be things around sort of participation that aren't necessarily uh, considered because you might have dropped your PPC because someone's been off sick, you know, and it, it sort of all paints a picture uh, as to what's going on general rule of thumb we say is about if, if a team is achieving sort of 70 i say 75 percent plus they're probably a pretty good team in terms of what they're doing but it is all relevant to, to the stage that the project's in level of information the maturity of the plan uh, and also the team just to know what they're actually doing at that stage i suppose um so yes yeah, it's, it's very contextual that's probably the way i would put it when it comes to answering this question, I actually really love to share a story. Um, very briefly, we were doing a COVID-19 project on a fairly small facility that was an active production facility. The client didn't want to shut down any of their operations, but yet we needed to build right in their space. I mean, it, it, it was right in the middle of their production space. And toward the end of the project, we were looking at the project as a whole. We had done all this awesome acceleration. We actually felt like the product was going very well. We were about to finish a little bit early on a very aggressive schedule. And my product manager called me and said, whoa, 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 I'm, I'm seeing our PPC numbers only 14%. Are we, what is going on here? Are we in big trouble? And I, well, I said, okay, well, let's, let's look at the data. Let's analyze it real quick because he hadn't been very close to that information. And so I came up with a quick summary for him. And what ended up happening was this client, since we were in their active production facility, was moving us around all over the place on a, on a daily basis, asking us to not work in this space that they had thought that we could work in just hours prior. And so there was a whole lot of moving around throughout the entire process, but that 14% was the critical path. And so what we were able to highlight was we worked and, and nailed the critical path. It was exactly what we needed to do on, on a critical path, but everything around the critical path had to move constantly. So it actually ended up kind of being a celebration of how much the team just had to evolve during the project yet meet success. So one of those situations where, whoa, 14%, if anybody's getting a 14% at any point, whoa, yeah, you should look into that for sure. But does it mean that things are going horribly? Not always. I love that. I love that. And it sounds like collaboration, again, is super key on a project like that where you're having to move around in a ton of moving pieces. So I love that story. That is great. Um, I've got one more question, unless anybody sends anything else in. Um, but what is the best way to get buy-in from my team to change our current process? Um, Tom, I'll start with you on this one. I'm not sure if you were part of the training and implementation but um do you have any advice for getting buy-in yeah so i have been on in a different 
project. So uh, for me, it's it's one of the biggest things about having the right project sponsor. Uh, so if you are trying to change a process or, or something of it, you need to have the right person to sort of back you up, whether that is the most senior person on that project, whether that's the project manager, as long as someone is brought into that who can add weight to what you're trying to do, um, it's brilliant. Uh, and you, that's a good foundation for you to then achieve success. I think uh, a lot of it stems around messaging, so making sure you can communicate the best benefits of, of what process you're trying to change and how you're trying to change it, um, and then sort of managing the various stakeholders that come with it. And in doing that, I think it, it helps create a picture, but also a challenge. So if you're, when you're trying to change the oh. process it's really important to know the people of that process that you're trying to to sort of influence and by that I mean you may have uh you may have someone who is very influential in the team but who may not be as bought into the process uh so you've got to win them over and if you can win those guys over that person over bring them on to, on board and they'll help bring the rest of the team on that journey with you uh, and similarly if they're not necessarily influential if you can find someone who's done it before so uh, if I could find someone from another design team, for instance, who's, who's done this change in the process to communicate to the design team I'm working with now, what that change looked like for them, how it succeeded and the impact it had on them, that is a really strong messaging point rather than just having me as an outsider coming in and saying we need to change this process because of X, Y and Z. Um, and then I also think, as I sort of touched upon earlier, it's sort of key to have sort of follow-up sessions. So whether that's, we use drop-in sessions quite often, but it's a, it's a way of getting continuing that message but if someone encounters a problem they can communicate it back or if they have questions on why they're doing it they can you can answer them in those sort of sessions and it just keeps people engaged in that process and keeps the momentum on that on that change going yeah absolutely uh adam what about you for getting buy-in for changing a current process so i'll, I'll kind of hop off of what tom was just saying and then offer some new thoughts as well but um those relationships that you're forming with those individuals are really, really important. Your entire team is is a relationship and a culture that you're building. And so setting those expectations very early, in, including maybe even in the contracting phase, uh, be, while contracts are being set up, make sure that people are aware what you wanna do here. Um, and then making sure that the right people are in the room. It's It can be hard, it, sometimes you just get individuals that are just very resistant to, to whatever process you want to put in place and that's very unfortunate but you as the manager of the process or facilitator of the process don't be afraid to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people get on their page you know make sure that we're on the same page but then also don't be afraid to also make a change if that person's not going to work out for the process it really only takes one one negative experience one person that's very outspoken in a negative way to really drag down a planning process. And I've only had to do it once in, in my entire career so far, but not being afraid to ask a person to please leave the room um, and, and, and get another replacement for that person. Sometimes that does involve leadership and that does involve you know, a situation that we certainly don't wanna get into, but make sure that you've covered all of your bases, have those honest conversations. There doesn't need to be yelling. This is all about trust, transparency, honesty, right? And so, um, if you cover those bases, then you know that you've done the right thing and you're all just trying to build a culture in the right the right motion moving forward. Um, the other thing that I would suggest in getting buy-in is taking baby steps. You don't have to just jump straight into, I discovered the last planner system at a conference, I discovered tech planning at, at a conference, and I'm gonna just, my team is gonna do it. You're almost always gonna fail that way if you're brand new to the process. And what you really, really, really don't want at the beginning of getting something like this off the ground is failing um, those those little victories are what really matter to a team and I'll, I'll kind of mention it again continuous improvement making sure that you're improving one percent every day and i'm not talking ppc or metrics i'm talking just improving yourself improving your team um, making sure that you're taking those little baby steps um, and accepting that perfection is fine uh or i'm sorry imperfection is fine if i said that wrong uh, continuous improvement is what it's all about Perfect. Perfect. Well, that is the last question that I have. So really appreciate y'all's time. Um, Carly, I'll let you close out, but thank you guys again so much.
Yeah, thank, thank you everyone who joined and listened. We hope you got something valuable out of it. Um, I know I, I always learn a lot when talking with you both. So hearing from your perspectives is great. I'm very grateful you were able to share with everybody. Hopefully everyone got something out of it. Um, I want to wish everyone who attended and both Adam and Tom a fantastic rest of your day. And if anyone does have questions in the future, feel free to reach out to the Patch Plan team. We are here to help. Bye, everyone. Thank you all. Thanks.